welcome to Sports Management Podcast, where you will hear interesting sports management professionals share their stories, experiences, and passion for the sports management industry. I am your host, Marcus Philipsson. Welcome to episode 156 of Sports Management Podcast. If you have ever learned anything from this show, please show your gratitude by subscribing to the podcast in your podcast app. And if you feel extra generous, leave a five-star review. This will help the show grow, and the bigger the show, the bigger the guests. Thank you. Welcome to episode 157 of Sports Management Podcast. Today's guest is John Kufis. He's the majority owner and CEO of Johnstown Tomahawks ice hockey team, the general manager for the Greek national hockey team, and an experienced CFO. We spoke about the process of becoming an owner of a team, his top five hockey movies, becoming GM of the Greek national team, Greek hockey and its development, being awarded the 2024 Adult Player of the Year by USA Hockey, and much more. John Kufis, welcome to Sports Management Podcast. Thank you, Marcus. Glad to be here. It's my great pleasure to have you on the show. We spoke here a little bit earlier about a lot of people that we know in common, but we first time we meet here today. So really, really excited to have you on the show. Excited to be here again, and thank you for the time. You are an experienced CFO and been uh, working in uh, high positions in several companies, but I'm thinking that maybe today we're focusing more on the sporting side of what you do. So you are the majority owner and CEO of Johnstone Tomahawks, as well as the general manager for the Greek national hockey team. Correct. Yeah, let's start with the with the Johnstown uh, how did that come about? How did you become a majority owner there? I come across, um, you know, my son had been playing junior hockey. He was playing at Johnstown for a little bit and had met one of the minority owners. And um, he casually mentioned, you know, as we got to know each other a little bit, um, w- would you ever be interested in possibly an ownership position, you know, in hockey or with the team? Uh, and then he went out to explain that. Uh, the current uh, majority owners, um, that ownership group had been in place for 10, 11 years, and that if there was a change, would you be interested? And it was sort of just a very generic question. I'm like, you know, I'll listen to anything, right? Business is business, and again, business and hockey, right? Obviously a great combination. And lo and behold, you know, there was some talk of a, of a change of the team maybe being sold, and uh, I, I got involved to look at the deal, and once we sort of got into it, um, it happened, frankly, very quickly. You know, the initial conversation was uh, late 2021, um, and once we really kind of got going into it, February of 23 was when it got sort of got really serious in terms of taking a look at it, and we closed May, May 1st of 23. It happened literally within 60 days. Wow. So, I mean, this is an interesting case because, for example, in Sweden, where I am, you don't buy and sell teams in the same way as maybe in the United States. So uh, can you explain a little bit the process? You mentioned it went through very quickly, but uh, how is the process there? The, the process is really, um, you know, there's there's two ways to sort of get into to you know our league, the uh, North American Hockey League. Um, you know, you either approach the league with a business plan um, and get approved for an expansion franchise or you purchase one of the current teams. And then certainly then you have the prerogative to move that team to a different city or continue where you're at. So the process is really no different on the the buy side than any other business transaction. You know, you exchange financial information, you look at the performance of of the business, in this case, the team, and then you make an offer. And you know, you have that usual back and forth sort of negotiation and you settle on a price and you execute the documents and that's it. I mean, it's pretty pretty straightforward. No different than any other you know business transaction where you're buying and selling, you know, large multinational companies. I understand. So uh, you know, obviously, you need to, as you said, come to a price and uh, have the team evaluated. And then, in your in your mind, like, how are you seeing? Are you seeing this as a long term investment, or is it that you buy a team and then to sell in X amount of years? And how how is the thinking process around that? My thinking process might be different than a traditional deal process, particularly if you're in something like private equity where you you buy a company and then you kind of do what you want to do with it in a call it three to five year window and then you sell it, return money to your investors and move on. Um, in this situation, having the passion of hockey that I have, this was really more an opportunity to 
combine again my business experience with hockey and um very much long term um knock on wood i'm you know four or five years out from from retirement um from the the cfo day job if you will um and this is i couldn't do nothing right i had to do something and this is certainly an amazing way to to be able to spend your in my mind to, to go to be able to spend my retirement years so it's very much long term i see and I think that's healthy from also, I mean, from a business perspective to see, to, it's easier to make a, 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 to have a long-term play in order to try to make a quick buck in quotes. Yeah, yeah. this is definitely not um, about, um, about making a buck. It's really more about, you know, having seen the junior experience firsthand, seeing friends of mine on uh, their children's experience firsthand. It was really sort of about, can we do a better mouse trap? Can we give more to the kids? So they look back on that two, three, four years, whatever it is they spent in juniors, they look back, particularly at Johnstown, that my God, that was the best four years of my life. So how did you get into hockey in the first place? You have you have Greek heritage and although both of us, you know, have played a little bit of hockey there and it definitely exists, but obviously not one of the major sports in that country. Correct. For myself, parents had immigrated to the States and, you know, I was playing Little League baseball at age nine. I skated a little bit, and then when the baseball season ended, uh, one of my friends was like was in a hurry. I'm like, "Where are you going? I I gotta go for hockey." And so it was the usual, you know, "Hey, I want to play too, right?" And so they uh, took me over, and we bought literally everything. I had nothing, so we bought literally everything head to toe. I remember this was 1975, and uh, you know, my dad looked at the uh, receipt on all the gear. He's like, "Oh boy," you know. And uh, that's how it started. I started playing youth hockey at age 10 and played all the way up through some lower level juniors till I was 20, quit for a couple of years to finish my degree at university, and then got playing into the, the senior adult men's league or, or beer leagues, as we like to call them. Yeah. And playing ever since. I've been doing that ever since. I'll be 59. I'm coming up on 59. So I've been, once I got out of school, I've been playing from age 22 till today. Still playing. Yeah. As you said, still going strong. And this year also awarded the Adult Player of the Year by USA Hockey. That's huge. Um, well, yeah, you know, a, a lot of that is clearly a, a lifetime participation type of thing. You know, playing in the adult leagues under the USA Hockey umbrella. USA Hockey runs everything from the five-year-olds all the way up through, you know, um, they actually have a 75 years age and over national championship every year. So I've been playing under that umbrella other than the brief period in the middle where I was participating with Greece and transferred federations, et cetera. But since, you know, the late eighties and, um, we started this, uh, team in 91 called the Chicago sharks, you know, because we like the San Jose sharks and we like the colors. That was really the basis of the decision. And, um, we've been doing it ever since the team's been together 34 years. We, we just won a 15 over national championship after uh, finishing second three times the last five years. And so, you know, that's 26 years after we won our first national championship in 1998 in the 18 and over division. So a lot of that award, I think, is sort of that whole body of work of participating in, in USA hockey in the national championships in the 18 and over, the 30 and over, the 40 and over, now the 15 and over. We actually have a team that played in the 16 over last year as well. You know, we've got a 30 and under team as well that are sons of players of the original team. Um, so it's kind of a family thing and we've been doing it for a very, very long time. So very appreciative. I'm totally surprised. I didn't even know that the award existed. It's just, it's uncomfortable because hockey is such a we thing, as you know, and that's such a me type of award, but nobody does hockey by themselves, right? No, no, that's true. It's uh, definitely a team, a team work, but still, you know, your contributions for hockey over a long time. And also now with the uh, Johnson Trauma Hawks and also your contribution to the Greek hockey that we will dig in a little bit deeper in soon. Well deserved and uh, congratulations. Thank you very much. It's, it, it's, I'm certainly proud of it. It was a neat event. Um, they, they put on a wonderful reception. I was um, recognized with five other amazing players in the game whether it was junior women's um the, the, the disabled category um for you know it, it was just a really nice event let's talk a little bit about johnstown tomahawks 
for the people that uh, are not uh, really familiar with the team, explain uh, a little bit like uh, yeah, where it's located and uh, the league, the NAHL, and uh, you know the performance and a little bit around the team. Of course. So the the North American Hockey League is uh, the second you know best junior league in uh, the United States uh, behind the USHL. In North America, uh, we usually are in the top five, along with the three major junior leagues. So, you know, very high skill level of play. Most all the players end up playing Division One or Division Three college hockey coming out of our league. Our team is located in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. We uh, are in the East Division, which has 10 teams. Johnstown, Pennsylvania also happens to be the, the city where uh, the movie Slapshot was filmed. Uh, and the slap shot they rechristened Johnstown and called it Charleston. Uh, so there was the team was modeled after the Johnstown Jets, which was an old uh, team back in the in the '60s and '70s that played in Johnstown. But for the movie purposes, they made it the Charlestown Chiefs. Uh, but our home arena is the actual arena that the movie was filmed in. So uh, we play in the War Memorial. Um, it's been refurbished, obviously, over the years. Most recently, in 2015, when Johnstown won the Craft Hockeyville award they give out, and so that helped refurbish the the arena a bit. And it's just a it's a marvelous arena with marvelous history. And our Tomahawks team that came to Johnstown in 2012 were merely just a continuation of the of the love affair that Johnstown has with the uh, sport of hockey. I understand, and I didn't know that about the Slapshot movie. But everyone who's in the hockey business has seen that movie, and uh, for everyone else, I suggest that they watch it because it's a great movie. It's a rite of passage for anybody that plays hockey. Make sure that you're age appropriate if you're watching it. There's uh, definitely some language and, and other things, but uh, it, it's a, it is a cult classic to say the least. And that note, right? We always we have these jokes. What are what are the what are the what's the holy grail? The Mount Everest of of hockey on on hockey movies yeah what are your five slapshot is definitely up there uh i can help you out if you want yeah please so there's there's miracle of course there's a the movie called young blood way back with rob lowe and patrick swayze a lot of people put goon <laughs> into the list for a different sort of type of movie um and then there's another one that's actually pretty good that we kind of name in the top five when we talk about is Mystery Alaska. Oh, I haven't seen that one. Yeah, it's it's about a team in Alaska and they get to play the New York Rangers and it's this whole uh, this whole interesting outdoor hockey game. So fun! It's a fun movie. It's a good. It's a good movie. What's his name? Is uh the guy from Gla- Russell Crowe is in that movie? I uh, see. Yeah, I didn't have to see that one. Exactly. So, anyways, that's that's sort of Johnstown and the team and the history and. Uh, it's it's we just finished our first year. We're getting ready. Actually, today is is uh, our draft. Our league draft is today. Uh, start starts in about another hour and a half. So the coaches and the scouting staff are doing their thing, and you know, I try to stay out of the way. I don't really get too involved. Uh, but the hockey people do their hockey thing, even though I do a lot with hockey. It's it's their side, and then we got the business side of hockey as well. Yeah, that's a good segue into my next question because I wanted to ask you are the majority owner and CEO. So what what is your responsibility as the CEO? Obviously, you oversee the whole thing, right? So you know, hockey has some type of accountability up up towards towards myself. Um, I spend the majority of my time on the business side, and you know, I've learned. Obviously, I never owned a team before. Um, you know, there's the the ticketing, the season tickets, our our sponsors. Uh, our, our suite sales, we have actually five suites, um, plus six suites actually in the arena. You know, so we have um, a gentleman uh, named Derek Parch, who is really in charge of those corporate partnerships. And then you've got, you know, we sell merchandise. And then we have uh, a community coordinator um, that does all community events and, and sort of, you know, is our way of giving back to the community and bringing awareness to the team. Um, you know, so Melissa, Melissa handles that. Brandon's in charge of ticketing. Derek, as I mentioned, does the corporate partnership. We have a director of communications, all the social media that's the rage these days, uh, Elena Moore. And then Ashley is the office manager and, and helps drive the, uh, the merchandising piece. Everyone's sort of got their own piece of the pie that creates the whole business side. And I think it's a good point because 
although like in our world like hockey is the centerpiece in our world or most of it at least but as a global sport is not you know among the the top ones but we're talking us and canada sweden finland so forth it's obviously big but so here's the you know a junior team and still this is a business it has the whole organization with the staff and everything and it's uh it's run like a business yeah it's every it's every bit of a business there's their sales, there's expenses, their budgets, um, you know, tax returns, the whole thing. I mean, it's it's every bit of a proper business. The only difference is, you know, we're not selling widgets as they like to say. We're selling hockey, right? The product is hockey. Um, so it's it's that's what makes it fun because obviously, you know, you 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 love the product you're selling, right? Uh, but it's they're two very very different businesses. The intersection happens with the players and the community appearances. And then uh, Melissa, uh, who I mentioned earlier, also handles uh, what they call billet. She's the billet coordinator. Um, so for those of you that don't know junior hockey, many times these kids leave their homes as early as age 16. Um, it's usually a four-year junior process in the States uh, through 20. And then most college freshmen are 20 years or you know old when they go into college as freshmen. These kids leave their homes and they go to host families. So we have families around the Johnstown community um, where these kids live for the whole hockey season and they house them and feed them and just make sure they're sort of, you know, they become their billet parents, you know, their hockey, their hockey mom and dad uh, while they're away from home. I mean, these kids are very far away from home, very, very far. So like now you mentioned there is the draft so people might, as you said, move uh, all across the country to come play for you if they get drafted. Uh, they would certainly come to to our main camp, uh, along with our returners, along with any other free agent invites. Um, and then from that main camp, we'll you know select 30, 35, I think it is, that will come to training camp. And there's eventually there's rules where you cut down to the final roster of, of 25 um, after you get through about the first month of the season. Interesting. You said you're a CFO in your day job, but uh, now you're CEO. Do you have a CFO or are you handling that as well for the team? No, I'm handling that as well. It's a business proper, but it's not, uh, you know, look, if we were 10 times the size, then sure, I would, you know, um, but it's it's your classic small business. Makes sense. So how how much would you say differs from your, your other job in the, call it corporate versus uh, handling in the sports industry? Well, little different from the standpoint i'm in manufacturing right so you know you have a, a significantly uh, you know we have eight folks that sort of work for the team you know we have over 300 and and certainly from the product standpoint uh, we're manufacturing something so you're you're buying raw materials you're you know using machinery and labor to build a piece of machinery which then you have to transport and ship you know kind of your a to b to c supply chain fulfillment um so it, you know there's different levers on the business right um uh, versus sports um we're sort of in the entertainment industry right the game is the entertainment um you know we're it's no different than a, a movie i suppose right except the difference is the movie is the live game right and you have you know customers coming to watch the entertainment so um you know that's actually the third facet of the business which is the in-game experience right uh, you know, how, you know, you have the mascot running around and you have the lights and the show and the this and the that and, uh, you know, the broadcast and the cameras and the mobile. And so um, it's a different type of fulfillment of the product. But that said, business is business. You know, many of the processes are exactly the same, absolutely identical. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because, as you said, business is business. Of course, there are similar things between the two, but then I was talking in a very early episode, we talked about fan engagement and with sports, you can technically put it into four buckets. You, if you have game day at the stadium, game day, not at the stadium, not game day at the stadium, not game day, not at the stadium. So you need to fill these four buckets because there is still something, even if there is not a game, there might be some other promotion or activity. And when there is a game, obviously that's the highlight, but then how do you involve the fans and the revenue and all surrounding that? Exactly. And that's where sort of the, the non-day engagement comes into play with those community appearances. You know, we'll send out Chopper, the mascot. And, you know, uh, he was out yesterday at a uh, the local library for a reading event. 
um, and you know, we publicize the reading event. Parents bring the kids there, and they'll do some you know type of engagement with the local mascot. The kids get interested, and you know they become engaged in you know the team by virtue of that interaction. So uh, from your point of view, how does a game day look like? It starts early as, as they start mobilizing. You know, our typical games will start 7 or 7.30. The doors open a little earlier for season ticket holders, uh, but generally speaking, an hour before the game. Um, so by the, time, by the time the doors open, you know, pretty much everyone's in place ready to do their thing. Um, we don't own our arena, you know, but all the concession folks are, are doing their thing. Um, we manage our own merchandise stands. Um, all the broadcast folks that are getting ready for the broadcast, we probably go on the air 30-ish minutes uh, before the game. All our game are, our games are streamed um, over NATV, which is our uh, proprietary uh, streaming network all over the world, frankly. You know, we have an announcer, a color commentator. We've got four guys that are handling the broadcast and running the scoreboard and that sort of in-game entertainment, whatever's on the board. Um, and you know, obviously our scoreboard operator and our, our DJ in the booth and the guys taking care of the penalty box. It's really exactly like a pro game, but obviously on a much smaller scale, you know, music in between whistles and everything. If we jump to the Greek hockey, it's some of the listeners might know, but I lived in Greece for a couple of years and got introduced to the hockey community in Greece, which is just fantastic, but, uh, it dates back longer back so can you give a little bit of a historic background of the ice hockey in greece yeah cer- certainly uh there's others that are much more knowledgeable about the history you know the, the cliff notes version is my understanding uh from the earliest days in the early 80s some czech greek expats came back to greece and brought the sport of hockey back with them and there were some some rinks at the time uh, in greece more than there are today, frankly, full size as well. Um, and they were playing and there were teams and, and they were doing kind of little leagues in country leagues. And then eventually, you know, participated in, in the earliest days in the world championships uh, with a couple of adult teams and, and junior teams. And that sort of was the story with a little bit of a gap in the mid nineties, all the way to late nineties. And then that's when the uh, national team went on hiatus tied to government change. I think the last full size ring closed down and that's a minimum participation for the IHF. But you know, there was a, a group of players led by by Jimmy Kalivas, who was the captain. Uh, and you know Jimmy, of course. Yep. Um, talk about a guy that has passion for the sport. None of it really exists at many levels without his sort of single minded determination to to keep the sport alive. You know we don't always get the cooperation you want from the governmental agencies, but really he sort of pushed the envelope hard in the early 2000s to, to get an exemption for Greece to get back into the world championships. Um, and that's how that all sort of came about in 2008. We got back in the game with a qualifier. You know, I was introduced to the team in the early 2000s and first flew over on my own to go practice with them in 2005. That's kind of how I started playing even though I was a little bit older. My nickname was Grandpa. But uh but yeah, that's sort of how it all started. And um, you know, we five worlds and two qualifiers through to 2013. And then, you know, the five year exemption passed, a rink didn't get built. Um, and then the program went dormant again. Um, and there's a whole lot of story underneath all that. And you're very familiar with it. Um but most recently um you know, we sent a team to, you know, for the first time in 11 years to this development comp. Some of my, we had, we had full tryouts in Greece, uh, put a team together. Some of my old teammates were actually on, on this team, um, but it was primarily composed of Generation Next. And that Generation Next is, are the kids that learn to skate on these small 20 by 40 rinks. There was a 25 by maybe 60 rink as well that's since closed down. Um, these kids learn to skate in Greece on these little studio rinks, and there is no development cup team without all these kids skating in Greece being, you know, led by names that you know: Morel, Dimitraki, Yotiev, Karpidi, Lee, uh, Spiro, Plutsis. You know, they help coach these kids to have this opportunity to play this development cup that just happened. 
Yeah, and that's uh, fantastic, right? And you, as you said, you mentioned a couple of names there and Jimmy as well, that, you know, the drive that it takes to keep this sport alive, because without these people pushing, then the sport could have died out in Greece. Absolutely. And you mentioned there, of course, have been a lot of hurdles on the way with you mentioned lack of governance support and also which governmental department you belong to, like sporting department. That has been one thing. And then you mentioned also IIHF uh, has some requirements to what you need to play internationally. And I believe that Greece uh, ticks all the boxes except for the full size rink. That's it. That's all that's left. Yeah. So, uh, so close, but there's still this one thing and uh, still going strong. And uh, in, I think, was it 2011 that you took uh, the silver, that Greece won the silver? 2010 in Luxembourg. In 2010. Some nice results there. And as you mentioned now, which is arguably the most important, the development cup with the up and coming, because there is a younger generation now in Greece that you mentioned that has started playing on these small rings, but that they, uh, they are really good. Yes. Yeah, they absolutely are good. And I'm not even talking about, you know, some of the the older teammates who were younger back when we were playing that are in their kind of mid-late 30s now. Then, you know, there's a batch in there from 16 to 24. They can play. And we just got to keep on developing them and get them, get them coached up and give them opportunities. They just need, need more experience. So the more tournaments like the Development Cup that we can do, you know, their development will accelerate, right? Because... You know, when you don't play a lot of games on a big rink, you play hockey differently. So it was a it was a really interesting experience, you know, to go from the first practice we had Slovakia till the last game um, to just watch their sort of IQ and how they were playing. I mean, it was really a, a hockey stick, not to use a pun, in terms of the difference from day one to to day eleven, and uh, it was very rewarding to see. And, and so, you know, there, everyone has a lot of very different opinions on how to proceed you know the the results we live in a results oriented society um, but the one thing that i thought that we were in agreement with was you know we're not measuring results in wins and losses you know because there's a lot of roster shenanigans as you know with these types of things and you know are they you know we are they really truly a national team or are they you know getting north americans with passports and that whole thing and so you know, we were very much a very clean, like our, this team could go play in a world championship for the most part. And that was the idea was to send a team that could grow and develop. So when we could get eligible, if somebody were to build a rink, we'd be ready to go. So we've talked about it with the Federation in terms of the long game, in terms of a five and 10 year plan. And I think that we made a nice first step to that sort of plan with this with this tournament will this be an annual thing the development cup um hope so that's the goal um if funding is always a challenge um we didn't get much if any help at all um for this year we did a gofundme uh page um and then we did some private donations it sort of you know as the phrase goes nickel and dimed our way <laughs> to to get the, the coverage for the cost they're, they're they're not inexpensive endeavors when you add um, you know, eight, nine days in a hotel and plane tickets and meals and all that. But uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful that um, this will be an annual thing and we will continue to follow the five, 10 year plan that's been laid out. And I'm hopeful that, you know, I'm included in that. You know, I, I'm the general manager of this team. It doesn't mean I will be of the next team. I, I'm hopeful that they uh, find value in, in what I'm doing. And you know, once we sort of get into a sort of a process, then it really, you know, you can sort of get everybody involved and have hockey people and hockey seats, right? You know, you do this, you do that. Um, whether it, it's Jimmy and Yoti and Spiro and, and the guys you know, and I know those are single names for everybody out there, but, you know, it, it takes truly all of us, right? It takes a community to do it. So this was really just the first start. It had to be done a certain way and we'll see where the future goes. Yeah, definitely. So on that point, you mentioned you are the general manager of this team. So what were your responsibilities uh, with the development cup team? Ultimately, the, the, the start of it was, was setting up a process from which we could select a team. Tryouts is not necessarily a word that is uh, common, maybe even in the Greek culture, let alone hockey. So we, we did a full tryout. 
you know, kind of capped it at, at, at kind of 50 years and younger. Um, there were some rules with the development cup. Um, you could have more than a couple people over 40, but you sort of had to manage how many you could play at any given time. Right. Um, so we had them be my, and the whole team had to be average age 30 and below. So we had those sort of roster rules from the IHF. Um, and we had probably 50 kids over, uh, you know, and, and there's about eight kids that were not there that were uh, eligible Greeks living outside Greece. Uh, we did a weekend tryout in Athens. So that was kind of the start of the process and the responsibilities. And uh, we cut that down to about 34, 36. And then we did a secondary tryout in Sofia, in Bulgaria, in early March. And from that team, we selected the final 25 man roster. Or 22, was it? 22, sorry. Interesting. So you mentioned also that you might be the general manager if there is one next year, if if they want you and so forth. So who are they? Was there a voting process to get you to this position? Or how did that hit? How did you get the general manager position? I was, uh, I had been introduced probably three years back now to the, the president of the federation, the Winter Sports Federation, which hockey falls underneath. Um, and we'd had some dialogue about, you know, who are you, what part of that process, what are you doing, et cetera. How did you get involved with hockey? I mean, that was really it. And then there was nothing for a couple of years plus. Then we happened to reconnect, and there was discussion about getting Greece into the development cup, and Greece had gotten approved. And it was like, how do we, you know, would you like to do something, right, and, and help put this together? So that's how kind of how it started. There was really not a voting process. It was, do you want to be the GM? Okay, fine. <laughs> you know. Yeah, so it's the federation that decided. Yes, sir. I understand. There was recently also, Greece have started, I don't know if it's five years now with a three-on-three tournament. Seven. So, seven years. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So uh, that's, uh, you know, something that started with uh, the local community in, in Greece or maybe even only Athens, yep. which has now grown to getting uh, international uh, traction with people flying in from Sweden and uh, many other countries as well. Sweden, Cyprus, to name a few. It's a, it's basically a celebration of the game. It's an all day tournament. The rule and setup construction is is amazing. It's hard. It's very hard. You know, try and play three on three for four minutes straight. You know, four man teams, three men on the ice. You need that break. It's it's hard, especially my age, right? But yeah, so the the local community started it. Jimmy had kind of um, was behind it along with. Uh, Demi, Alex, and Jason, and Spiro, and they were kind of running it. Even when Jimmy was in Montreal, um, his hands were all over sort of the administration of it to make sure it went off. And it's just grown into this incredible event. Definitely. I still have a PTSD from year one when I lost the final on penalties. So uh, I haven't won the golden shovel yet, but I need to give it another try another year. The boys from Sweden got a pretty good grip on it now five years in a row. We'll see if you know next year is another year. See if someone can uh, can take them take them down. But they're great. They're great. They're great guys, by the way. I've gotten to know them over the last few years, and um, you know, they're it's just the whole, the whole thing is really a celebration of hockey. Exactly. Literally, the literally that's the last event of the year. They turn the lights off. They turn the electric off, and the ice is gone. Yeah, so that, no, that was my point also that that's, as you said, a celebration of hockey is a great way of putting it, but also a great way to, you know, promote Greek hockey as well. As we said, that it's just started very locally and now it's uh, not not global, but, it, you know, it, it's growing. It's the awareness, right? And uh, and then on the development side, Greece for many years was locked into these sort of, um, they call them somatia, these registered teams and what have you. Um, and for the first time this year, and there was a lot of sort of inequality of those teams, right? And for the first time this year, uh, spearheaded by, by by Jimmy, again, they created a four-team league. They spread all the players out amongst four teams to create four very equal teams. Uh, the Athens Ice Hockey League was born, and they ran it and uh, had an incredible season. And, uh, you know, that those championships ended right before the three-on-three. So it's kind of... You know, everything sort of concluded right at the end there. Um, and for those kids that played in that league and and, and, the, and the older players as well, 
you know, to have something with a scoreboard and a league and proper and standings and, and score sheets and statistics really benefited the development of Generation Next. So it's everything's there but the rink, Marcus. Yeah, we need uh, we need someone to put in some investments to build that. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. It's been the talk for for many many years. Too many, too many years. Uh, I'm I'm hopeful. Um, you know, I'm certainly knocking on doors and having conversations, uh, as are many other people. I'm I'm hopeful that that we get it done within as part of this five ten year plan that I mentioned earlier. I really hope so as well. So just to plug uh, the Greek ice hockey, there is, uh, if someone wants to read up more on it, uh, Jimmy has a great website with some history and information. So it's icehockey.gr. And also I think it's uh, Greece ice hockey on most of the social media as well, if uh, to follow that. Yes, yes. There's some, there's a, there's probably one other one that's Greek ice hockey, but that's, that's a different sort of uh, person running that whole thing. But yeah, the ones you mentioned are are sort of the, quasi official sites um you know then of course you can get news on the actual winter sports federation site you know there's some hockey stuff on there from time to time as well so leaving greek ice hockey and uh, some questions that i like to finish off with is uh, has there been any bumps on the road in your career and if so how did you overcome them uh hockey specifically yeah we can do that oh yeah i mean um, not really, not really. I mean, uh, you know, most people associate bumps with injuries. Um, I've been very fortunate. Uh, somebody asked me that question, part of the USA hockey thing. And, uh, I said, you know, other than, you know, five broken noses and, you know, 50 some odd stitches in my face, I'm doing okay. How about from the business perspective? If now with the, with the Tomahawks, for example, it's pretty recent, but still it- yeah, the Tomahawks is a year. It was a transition year. You know, I, I think uh, it's a learning experience from both sides, right? I'm bringing sort of my business side um, to the hockey. The folks that were working there brought, you know, their hockey, what they've experienced to me. And we're, you know, sort of kind of meeting in the middle um, to create a better, a, a better everything, right? Um, business, hockey for the kids, fan engagement, etc. So really not... Not too many hiccups other than, uh, you know, we lost in the first round of the playoffs. Our head coach resigned after the season to, uh, to he's, been, he's been the head coach for about 10 years. And uh, his kids are getting an age where he wanted to spend more time with his family. Uh, and I certainly respected that. You know, he, he walked away from the last year of his contract. So, you know, a lot of the early stuff, even while I was in Slovakia, um, was managing the, you know, the hiring of a new head coach, uh, which we, we wrapped up a couple of weeks ago. And we have a new head coach in place and ready for the draft. And so, yeah, specifically the Tomahawks, it's sort of year one and onward and upward. Exciting. You know, yeah, it is exciting. It is exciting. We, uh, we won, we, we invested a lot in our broadcast last summer because ultimately I would like to get our games on actually proper television within our community to, to help again, bring awareness. And we literally just found out yesterday that we won the NATV production award from the league as having the best broadcast in the entire league, um, which is really exciting for everybody involved with the broadcast. Cause you know, we went from one camera to seven, you know, obviously we upgraded the quality of the camera, you know, instant replays, in-game interviews and it, the whole thing, trying to make it look like a broadcast that you and I know from the pros. So we you know we did our version of that and it was nice to be recognized by the league. That's fantastic. Is is that the uh, like AI cameras or are there seven people managing these cameras? Uh, we've got two people managing the main camera and the mobile that goes around. The rest are sort of auto kind of AI cameras, you know. And the one, the one underneath, uh, we have one underneath the scoreboard now that does the whole three hundred and sixty thing. You know, when you see that shot looking down the face off at center ice, yeah. So we got those now, and it kind of whirls around, does the three hundred and sixties, and we got a couple right over the goals that we tied into the league uh, because we're doing sort of goal reviews now, not challenges, but we have a goal review process as well. Um, So the league's helped a lot too, in terms of just, uh, we launched our own TV broadcast system this year called NATV. Um, So that was the first year of that as well. Um, So the league's helped a lot for everything to kind of just be, you know, bring the quality up. 
because sometimes you can't be at the game, but you want to see something that you can at least decently watch on on a stream. Definitely, and that's what we talked about before, right? The game day, not at the stadium. How can you watch the game if you're not there? Exactly. And I view it, pe- people are like, do you worry, like with the TV? Oh, if you put it on TV, people will come to the game. I go, yeah, I, I view it differently. I view it as a three-hour commercial that people see it and it jumps out at them. They go, okay, I need to go there. I, I need to be in the building. And you know this, you have to watch the game live. There's no better, like, Hockey is meant to be watched live. The sound, the smell, the ice, you know, it just, you don't get hockey unless you watch it live. 100%. What would be your best advice for a young person who wants to pursue a career in the ice hockey business from a man- more of a business side, not as a player? Yeah, from the business side, you know, there's so many angles to it, right? Do you want to be a, a, a coach? So when you're done playing and you're done getting whatever experience as a player, you know, you immediately get into go be an equipment manager, go be an assistant coach, uh, be a be a video coach, right? Whatever it is, find places where you can be part of the hockey staff if you want to go that route. On the business side, you know, it depends what your interests are, right? You know, there's well, actually there's one other thing on the hockey side, you know, you can go into um, a lot of there's a uh, sports management now, right? Where you can go to school, tie it in with your, your your maybe becoming a lawyer with a concentration on sports management, and you can be an agent, you know, and, and hook up with one of the sports agencies, right? You know, on the business side behind the scenes, you know, sales is sales, right? So, you know, you can get in and help sell tickets, help sell sponsorships. If you're in marketing, right? Go be the marketing department, be the the communications department. So, you know, all of the disciplines of business, right? You know, marketing, sales, communication, et cetera, they all have a place in the sports world. So if you're a marketing major and you want to work for a hockey team, try and find an internship, right? With the sports team, your local sports team, um, in any of those disciplines that you like, right? You need to start in college getting those experiences in conjunction with whatever major that you're that you're going to school for. For sure. And I think internship is uh, obviously something I've discussed a lot on this podcast, but I think it's so crucial because it's something you can do during your studies also to not only know what you like, but maybe more importantly, to know what you don't like. Exactly. And that's as important as you said as anything, right? A lot of people don't learn what they don't like until it's too late. That's true. I'd like to finish off with a networking question. So who from your network do you think would be a good guest on this podcast? Ooh, that's a good question. You know, I've got some contacts that actually are, you know, general managers, assistant general managers of uh of national hockey league teams. I could I could maybe uh maybe connect you there with with one of those gentlemen. That would have been amazing. As you know, I'm uh, I'm a hockey guy, so that's uh that's of highest interest. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else, uh, final words before we sign off here? No, uh, we don't know each other that well, but we've been aware of each other for years, right? And so I've, I've followed you and uh, both in Greece and after you left Greece. And, and you'd mentioned before the call that, uh, you know, you've certainly been aware of, of me just as one of the kind of gang of Greek hockey. And uh, certainly really appreciate the opportunity to, to connect and talk like this. Uh, I had a blast. And uh, my point is, I love what you're doing because it's all about just hockey, hockey, and hockey. Like that, that I'm a one trick pony, you know? I, I, I sort of say I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a hockey guy disguised as a finance guy. <laughs> At my core though, I'm a hockey guy. Thank you. And uh, I'm a big fan of you. So thank you so much for taking the time to be on the podcast. Likewise, thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Sports Management Podcast. Please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes. Also, feel free to leave a comment about what you thought about this episode. If you want to get in contact with me, send an email to sportsmpodcast at gmail.com or hit me up on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram at sportsmpodcast.